Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. It's really an honor to be invited to a gathering like this. Uh, I'm very impressed uh, with everybody who's spoken and with many of the people I've met. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Uliol for uh, reaching out to me uh, at first and everyone else who's helped me along and, and shown me really great hospitality. It's a kind of, uh, it's, it was very nice that the that uh, Sheikh Tamara Gray's uh, talk uh, had the subject matter that it did because it, it dovetails almost perfectly into the beginning of my own talk. Uh, some of you might not be familiar with the, the term sunnah that's in the title of the talk. Uh, my talk is entitled, if you haven't looked at the program, uh, sunnah, uh, culture as an extension of the sunnah, but hopefully as I, as I speak, uh, what I mean, what, what is meant by that and what I think can be meant by that will become clear. My talk tonight is about culture, the idea of culture, the reality of culture, the significance of culture, and the importance of culture. This word, culture, uh, is on the lips of, well, everybody, but especially for Muslims. Uh, it's really part of a lot of our conversations that we have with each other and that we have with other people. Um, and I pay attention to these conversations. I listen to them very closely. And what I'm finding is that we're having a problem with actually understanding what we mean when we say this word, that, this word culture. Um, you hear terms like popular culture, dominant culture of the society, back home culture, immigrant culture. Uh, you hear people talking about culture versus religion. You hear about multiculturalism. You hear culture wars, uh, Western culture. The word culture appears in so many guises and in so many different kinds of contexts. Uh, you have to sort of stop and say, wait a minute, what does this word actually mean? And if you actually stop and maybe actually kind of go on the web or go to a library and research what the word actually means, it's very discouraging because you find a whole slew, a myriad of definitions which are mind-bogglingly diverse and it seems as each one is more incomprehensible than the other. It seems to be a very hard word to define, but it also seems to be a word that we just can't do without in our conversations with each other. It's an abstract idea. That is to say, uh, like the word authority or identity or tradition, or even the word Islamic, um, it has a kind of a grand scope. It's trying to encompass a lot of things at once. Um, and for that reason, it's subtle. It's hard to get one's hands and one's mind around. It's a powerful concept, but it's also a mercurial one. Uh, it's indispensable, but because of this encapsulating power that it has, it's also dangerous. Dangerous in the sense that it can create various kinds of misunderstandings. Um, it has a kind of a polyvalence and, to use a kind of a philosophical term, equivocality to it such that when different people are having conversations about this thing called culture, if you pay attention, you see that they often run into dead ends, or they start talking in circles around each other, and the conversation can only, only go so far. Now, what I'm going to try and do in my talk, at least in the first part of my talk, is to examine a little bit and maybe try and answer the question, what are we talking about when we talk about culture? That is to say, let's move from this abstract concept and actually get into the concrete particulars of what it is. Because if we're not able to with these abstract ideas like culture and identity, religion, if we're not able to move from those abstracts to the particulars and then back to the abstract and back to the particulars easily, we're not really understanding what we're talking about. And especially when it comes to an important term like culture, which is the one I'm going to be focusing on tonight, uh, that has the real possibility for creating misunderstanding, and we know what misunderstanding can also create. So let me now uh, talk about what I think, uh, those are just a few remarks about the, you might say, the concept of culture. What about the reality of culture? What is this thing that we call culture? Now it seems to me that if you stop and examine those objects of experience that are, we're talking about, culture has to do with beauty, it has to do with refinement, it has to do with norms and customs. When you're talking about culture, or a culture, or something that's cultural, you're talking about what's worth keeping, what's worth holding on to, 
And at the same time, what's best to discard? What's best to get rid of? When you're talking about culture, you're talking about the good and the bad of everything that human beings do and everything that human beings produce. That is to say, to talk about culture is to talk about judgment, the judgment between what's good and bad, the judgment between what's beautiful and ugly. Um, a decision that's made about what is appropriate and what is inappropriate, a decision or an apprehension about what's harmonious and what's dissonant. Which is to say this, culture, whenever you use the word, has something to do in every single instance with the ought of things or the should of things. That is to say you're talking about the way things should be, the way things ought to be. Not simply what happens to be going on. It's not simply a set of facts, but culture transmits something about the way things should or ought to be. And in a sense, you can think of it as a collectivity or an accumulation, an aggregation of millions of people's decision, decisions and judgments about what is, what they're experiencing, what they actually are coming into contact with but also the judgment or the decision or the evaluation that takes place about all those things that we do, that we say, that we build, that we make, the way that we interact, the way that we organize, and so forth and so on. But here's a very important point. These judgments are not simply about aesthetics. Or I should say, judgment is not simply about right and wrong. Judgment can be about right and wrong. It can be about the good and the bad. It can be about the beautiful and the ugly. It can be about the appropriate and the inappropriate. Anytime one is making a decision, one is making an evaluation, one is exercising this thing we call human judgment. Sometimes called the practical intellect. I, mean, I have to mention these philosophical terms being who I am, but I won't en encumber you to, with too many of them. Um, and I'm using these kind of two ideas of our experience, the fact of things as they are, but then also our judgment about things as they are. And if you think about it for a second, you, there's never a single moment in your life when you're experiencing something or doing something that you're not also simultaneously making a judgment about it. That is to say, you're, you're, when you see something, instantly you perceive whether that is beautiful or ugly. Or if you see a person carrying out an action, you immediately apprehend something about whether it's a noble action or it's a vile action. In any domain of experience, we're always, in t we're always experiencing both the fact of a thing existing as it is, and also that ought or that should aspect of things. It's kind of like when you see the moon. There's no way of seeing just the shape without also seeing the color. Right? That's how, our, in a sense, our experience are geared in that way. In Arabic, there's a concept, there's a word, a beautiful word called ihsan. Which, and, and various other words related to it. And this word is very interesting. And it tells us something about, in, at least in Arabic and in Islamic cultures, how this, you might say, an aspect of judgment is interpreted. The word ihsan applies not only to that which is virtuous in terms of human behavior, it also applies to that which is beautiful in aesthetics, which is to say there's a single word for what's beautiful and also a single word for what's good. I'll come back to that. I'll come back to the concept of Hassan. Now, in culture, you have both, and this is usually where the problems come up, a misunderstanding or let's say a confusion, or at least we have to acknowledge that there's the absolute and the relative when it comes to culture. What do I mean by that? That is to say, culture, this thing that we call culture, has something absolute and intrinsic about it. Just as a thought experiment, if you imagine 10,000 people, let's say you have 10,000 people, 10,000 saintly people, um, and you give them a set of conditions to build a culture and to build a society. Now what happens if you take 10,000 mediocrities, 10,000 bad people, and you give them the same set of starting conditions and you ask them to build a society? The culture that will be created, as we, you can guess, is going to be different. That is to say there's something intrinsic to those human beings that you, can, you just know automatically that the culture that they create is going to be different. There's something absolute and unchanging in that. But think about another thought experiment. Think about the same group of 10,000 people. Put them into a desert environment. 
and see what kind of culture they build. Now, take those same 10,000 people and put them into a forest environment. See what kind of culture they build. That is to say, those two cultures that are produced will be different, which tells us that there's also something relative about culture. There's also something extrinsic about culture. It's not all absolute, it's not all relative, it's not all intrinsic, it's not all extrinsic. When you talk about the absolute, we're talking about what the, what the people in a culture think, what their vision of reality is. What is a human being? What is the nature of God? What is the moral structure of the world? But when it comes to relative things, we're talking about things like climate, resources, scarcities, the political context, one's political adversaries, the inherited set of skills, and other particularities of a locality, which aren't intrinsic, you might say, to the human population, but are extrinsic factors which are influencing the kind of culture that they uh, produce. And so when I pay attention to the kind of conversations that people have about culture and about the role of culture, very often it's about these two poles. It's about sorting out the absolute from the relative. It's about sorting out what's really intrinsic versus what's extrinsic, versus what's essential, what's important and crucial to have, and what's just optional and variable and things that we can do without depending on the circumstances. For Muslims, this absolute comes from the Qur'an and it comes from the way of the Prophet This way of the Prophet or his sayings and his doings or th this beautiful English word want, W-O-N-T, the want of the Prophet or the wants of the Prophet, his sunnah, this, this word in, from Arabic, S-U-N-N-A-H. The twin sources of the Qur'an and of the Prophet's sunnah are for Muslims the absolute in the things that they do. It's the unchanging pivot. That's what doesn't vary from one place to another, whether you're in a forest culture or a desert culture, or you're in an urban environment or you're in a rural environment. Those are the things that don't change. Those are the sources uh, of the absolute. But there are, and so the relative comes from other sources. It comes from extrinsic factors. Now, Usually when people talk in this way, it, 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 it sort of it becomes a dichotomy where we place religion, this very actually problematic word in English, the history of the word religion in English is actually kind of not as simple as one would think, but this is not a lecture about religion, it's a lecture about culture. We usually put religion on one side and culture on one side, and we think that there's this kind of wall between them and that there's no really overlap. But that's not true at all. The, the, the things we talk about when we talk about religion and the things that we talk about when we talk about culture intermingle and are overlap in a myriad of ways and in a lot of cases are synonymous. Really, we're talking about the same things. Now, when you survey Muslim opinion about the relationship between religion and culture, there's a range of opinions as to how these two things should interact. One extreme position is that those twin sources, the sources of the absolute as I describe them, the Qur'an and the Sunnah, provide, in a sense, both the absolute and the relative. They provide everything that one could possibly conceive of that we talk about when we talk about culture. As if everything, in a sense, in these sources were finished and fully actualized without any need for refinement or discernment or anything like that. That is to say, there's no acknowledgement in a sense. There's a kind of a, a, a holding to these two sources as providing not only the absolute content that we usually associate with culture, but the relative content as well. And everything else is dismissed as being irrelevant. It's, it's dismissed with a sense of indifference. And culture, those things we talk about when we talk about culture, um, is de-emphasized. That's a very extreme position which I think is very problematic because I don't think it really deals with reality. It doesn't deal with the reality that we face and it certainly doesn't do a very good job of describing Muslim cultures as we've known them throughout history. A second way to deal with culture and this relationship with religion comes from the legal tradition of Islam itself. Anyone who studied Islamic law or looked at Islamic law carefully will tell you 
that local cultures and the local norms and customs of a place into which Islam and Islamic law comes are not only allowed to be taken in and to become part of Islamic law, but it's imperative that the local customs, so long as they're long-standing and they're accepted by people of sound judgment, as long as those conditions pertain, not only are you allowed to incorporate aspects of the local culture into the law, for example, what does a woman, what does a wife do as maintenance or you know, other, let's say, norms of the market and so forth, you're supposed to incorporate those things. And local culture becomes part of the Sharia. It becomes part of Islamic law from that point of view. And traditional Islamic law has always had a very healthy discourse about looking at the local customs and ways of a people and seeing how those can be incorporated into Islamic law, and, but at the same time, what should be discarded and what should also be kept out. There's a wonderful paper uh, written by uh, Dr. Omar Farouk Abdullah on this topic where he discusses um, what he calls the cultural imperative, and this is a very important aspect of that, and how not only is culture, from that point of view, allowed by Islamic law, but it's necessitated by Islamic law. But it goes much farther than that. We're not only talking about uh, that which is allowed by the law. There's, there's more subtle and profound points, I think, that could be made about that. Let me come back to this word sunnah. Um, as Muslims use it, uh, sunnah has come to mean when you talk about the sunnah, you're talking about the sunnah of the Prophet. That's what we mean when we say the sunnah, his way, the way, literally. But if you look at the traditional sources, we see that at the time of the revelation of the Quran to the Prophet Muhammad, the word sunnah also had other meanings, which aren't used as commonly now, not because Muslims rejected them, but just because of the way history developed and how the word sunnah came to occupy the place that it did. Um, but uh, 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 in the Quran, in chapter 3, 137, uh, it said, and I'm going to use the plural of sunnah here to read this quote from the Quran, sunan have passed away before you. So journey upon the earth and behold how the deniers, that is to say the disbelievers, fared in the end. Now this word sunan appears here, which is the plural of sunnah. That is to say, ways have, if I was to be literal, you would say ways or wants or customs have passed away, that is to say throughout history. So travel through the earth, look at the remnants of these sunan to see how they ultimately fared in the end. But actually, if you step back for a second, the way that we use the word cultures could be used here very properly as a translation, in this particular instance, not in all instances, for the word sunnah. That is to say, cultures have passed away before you. So journey upon the earth and see how they fared in the end. There's a hadith of the Prophet, والسلام, where he says, whosoever establishes a good sunnah, shall have its reward and the reward, the reward of those who act according to it until the day of resurrection. And whosoever establishes an evil sunnah, a bad sunnah, shall have its punishment and those who act according to it until the day of resurrection. So even in the literature of the hadith, we see that this notion of sunnah, this notion of way, has this sense of a, an established, a kind of establishing a norm, establishing a practice. Uh, it has this idea of doing something which is either going to be considered right or considered wrong. Another term that comes up in the Quran, which, which, which is important for understanding the word culture, the term ma'roof. There's a very central ethical concept in Islamic civilization called commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. Al-amru bil ma'roof wa nahyan al-munkar. And this word ma'roof is extremely interesting if you look at its etymology. It literally means that which is known but more so that which is recognized. And even in English, re recognized has both a factual and a moral sense. You recognize something, but also if you recognize something, you're also approving of it and affirming of it. That's what ma'roof means in the Quran. And it's used over and over again um, as a way of describing what one should do, what is good, what is honorable, what is right. Um, but it's not, it's not defined in the Quran as such. There's a kind of an assumption that the recipient, uh, that the, I should say, the audience of the Quran sort of knows what ma'roof means. 
There's no doubt, of course, that it, this is expanded upon in the tradition, but there's also a sense that this maruf, what is recognized, it's an appeal to what is, no, what is affirmed by people of good judgment. As I say, what is considered to be honorable and what is considered to be good. Um, there's even ways of speaking in Arabic which aren't even words, but they're kind of grammatical constructions. Uh, like ma huwa alayh, the idea of someone being upon something. Literally, to talk about someone being on something, when it's, depending on the, the way it's used in context, means you know, the way somebody does things, the, the, their customs, the rules one follows, and so forth. And one finds this terminology in, in various hadith. And there's all sorts of other terms in Islamic civilization, like adat, uh, which means customs or ways, or adab, which usually means something like courtesy or manners. And all I'm trying to do here is to establish that, in a sense, within the Islamic tradition, you have this spectrum of words and the spectrum of ideas that seem to be talking about precisely what we talk about when we employ this word, which hasn't been around for that long, since probably around the middle of the 19th century, culture. Of course, the word's been around longer than that, but I'm talking about the usage of the word culture. And so it's talking, in a sense, about a lot of different things. Now, the way I'm approaching this, where I'm trying to um, make connections, is that I think one can think of the Prophet's Sunnah, in a sense, as the prophetic culture. If you, if, you, if you take into account all the things that I've said up to this point. That is to say, the prophet's culture, it's those norms and those customs and those judgments which cultivate us as Muslims. The prophet said, والسلام, I have come but to perfect the virtues, which is how I'm translating makarum al-akhlaq, which you can not translate but paraphrase as saying, I have come to cultivate the virtues in other people. That's where the word culture comes from, after all, cultivate. Um, because the Prophet Sunnah manifests the virtues into which we hope to grow. The Prophet Sunnah is not just something we follow because we're ordered to do it, but also, in addition to that, because we understand, as Muslims, that his example is the result of a virtuous soul into which we hope to grow. And that by following his, again, I'm putting culture in quotations marks, his sunnah, uh, we hope to grow into that example and manifest it the way, you know, when you teach your children to say thank you and please, they don't really get what the point is in the beginning. They don't understand the logic of it. It just seems like a chore. But then as they mature, this culture which you've given them, they grow into and they appreciate and it allows them to manifest their own virtue. And Muslims conceive of the entire sunnah as being something like that. We need in this country an authentic and vibrant and robust American Muslim culture. There's no doubt about that. This is an absolute imperative and I'm far from being the first person to say something like that. But there are challenges. There are challenges to getting there. And pretty much every Muslim in the room and those who are close to Muslims will see and will recognize these challenges as I, as I list them. One is how do you deal with the so-called back home cultures? Right? How do you deal with your, your parents' culture or maybe your own if you're yourself an immigrant? How do you deal with the so-called back home, back home or immigrant, immigrant cultures? And even if it's not your own family's culture, your friend's culture. And secondly, how do you deal with American culture? How do you deal with the culture that's here right now? Since this isn't a majority Muslim country and it's not a, it's not a culture that was formed through adherence to the Quran and the Sunnah. And we do need to address these issues. We need something that can plausibly be called and reasonably be called an American Muslim culture. Most advanced timekeeping note I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> I'll, up. I'll wrap up as fast as I can. Okay. We can't be indifferent to culture. No human being can be indifferent to culture, no matter what you want to call it. And the reason why I mentioned all of these classical terms that Muslims have in their tradition is because no Muslim society that's worth its salt was ever indifferent to those things. So we shouldn't be indifferent to those things. Why? Human beings have one heart. We have one capacity for understanding that concept I called ihsan, beauty, goodness, 
this reality in the world. We only have one. We're not multiple beings inside of a single body. If we're indifferent to beauty in forms, beauty in architecture, if we're indifferent to the intellectual culture, if we're indifferent to, to institutional culture, if we're indifferent to basically the vast majority of our lives and we think that then when it comes to moral and spiritual decisions we're going to exercise proper and sound judgment when our heart has been coarsened by exposure to the ugliest, most unreasonable type of things in our lives, we're really kidding ourselves as Muslims. That's not going to happen. So far from seeing the expressions of culture as being seductive and distracting, which they can be for sure, they're also refining. They also refine the human being's capacity for ihsan, that is to say, for the understanding of what is good and bad, what is beautiful and ugly, which really amount to the same thing. Um, we can't just leave a big empty hole where, uh, and suppose that we can just be religious and not worry about culture and not build an authentic local culture because something else will fill that space. We don't live in virgin nature. We live in buildings, we live in cities, we live in an environment that's created by human beings. And if we're not going to be discerning about the vast majority of our experience, whether it's good, bad, ugly, beautiful, and dissonant, and not dissonant, um, our capacity then to talk about spiritual questions, to understand truth, to understand the beauty of an argument, to understand the logic of an argument, will be reduced. I think those things are very much um, connected. Um, I may have to skip over some stuff here, but I just... I go one minute over. I personally don't watch the stuff. All right, so it's technology. I'll pretend I'm not seeing it. Basic, let, me just, let me just make a quick rundown of what the pros and cons are of dealing with this so-called back home culture and the, and the American culture. And there are some real pros and some real cons. The pros to adherence and accepting and of just transmitting the back home culture. Well, first of all, there's a lot of wisdom in it. There, there, there's, there's a lot of experience in our back home cultures. These are cultures which have built themselves on the Quran and on the Sunnah. There's a lot that's there's a lot of experimentation that happened. There's a lot of discarding of bad ideas and of ugly poetry and of bad looking buildings and of so forth and so on that they've gone to the trouble of go of, of, of taking care of for us and are now bequeathing to us. So there's a lot of positive that's there. And there are depths to that. It's not just a question of people who follow Islamic law. The souls of Muslim majority countries, the souls of the artists and of the intellectuals were chiseled and formed by the Quran and the Sunnah and what they produced has a kind of an intrinsic quality to it that radiates the sacred sources of the religion in a way that's very subtle but extremely profound. But there's also cons because these cultures have an extrinsic relative character to them. Not everything they do is, is going to work over here and we should just be open and honest about that. Yes, it can be a treasury of wisdom. Yes, it can be a shelter, but it can also be a prison. It can also transmit a lot of things which will hurt us. We have to be open about that. Never mind the kind of, often the fake evocation of authority, of exotic authority that sometimes people bring over, and the paternalism, which is a separate issue that, 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 aff that afflicts Muslim communities in this country. What about American culture? The pros. Well, American culture, this is where we live. This is, where, this is where Muslims are. Um, people un the, the culture understands the world that it lives in. You know, if you want to know how to live here, you take it from the culture. There's no doubt about that. There's a lot of wisdom and a lot of beauty, um, really immeasurable wisdom and beauty in the American cultural tradition. But at the same time, there are cons. It's full of you know, modern uh, Western culture has all of the usual distractions and temptations and error and dehumanizations and Coarse, coarseness and error, um, which any religious person has to worry about. There's no doubt about that. But it's not all that is the point. And one has to be discerning and exercise judgment about it. We have to accept critically and we have to reject critically. Um, the Quran and the, the, the Sunnah are, yes, they're about traditions as well, but there's no, more, there's no more book more unforgiving of the blind following of one's forefathers, whether in the back home country or here, than the Quran. If your forefathers were fools, the Quran says, why are you following them? So there has to be a discernment that's exercised. There are a lot of wonderful Muslim uh, cultures around the world, and we should benefit from them as Muslims, and uh, we do. 
And it's a kind of an, it's a richness, and it's an enriching experience for us. Um, but at the same time, I think this is an important point, and I want to end it with this. American Muslim culture doesn't simply have to be a museum of other Muslim cultures. It can also be its own culture. It can create its own beautiful customs. It can create its own arts, its own intellectual culture, which of course is the most important aspect of culture that there is, the spiritual and intellectual culture. It doesn't have to be a collage of pre-existing languages and forms of art. It can be its own, and we can take from the richness of the American tradition. And this is not only going to be good for Muslims, which is kind of the perspective I've been coming from. I'm an American Muslim. I care about this issue. I've wrestled personally, as have my friends and my family, with the questions of culture. Uh, but it'll be good for American culture as a whole. Um, the addition of a robust, vibrant, living American Muslim culture of the kinds that you can find in Turkey and in Egypt and in Pakistan is not going to take away from the overall culture. It's going to enrich it. I think uh, uh, Congressman Ellison said, isn't it, it's, it's make America more American rather than less. And so, um, you know, so I hope this meditation, as it were, on the meaning and the scope and the dimensions of culture has been uh, helpful in at least perhaps clarifying the issues and helping us to think uh, about our situation because a lot of these questions are maybe quite deep and sometimes beneath the surface of some of the more superficial and exposed problems that we have. Um, thank you again. Thank you for your attention. I'm sorry for taking up so much of your time. Thank you.